name is Lisa Alastway, and on this channel, you will find a variety of inspirational and informational videos. So if that sounds good to you and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. My guest today is Dr. Todd Rose, who is the co-founder and president of Populous, a think tank committed to ensuring that all people have the opportunity to pursue fulfilling lives in a thriving society. Prior to Populous, he was a faculty member at Harvard University, where he founded the Laboratory for the Science of Individuality and directed the Mind, Brain, and Education program. He is the author of several best-selling books, including Collective Illusions, Conformity, Complicity, and the Science of Why We Make Bad Decisions. Welcome, Dr. Rose. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Nice to meet you. I'm happy to have you on my channel today. So um, let's just kind of start a little bit with your background. I find it quite fascinating that you were a high school dropout and you became a Harvard professor. And that is yeah. statistically an anomaly. Can you explain a little bit about your background? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, you know, I'm proud of all the work, you know, I've done professionally, but like you said, uh, it's a little bit sort of ironic that you know, I ended up being a public intellectual and a professor, but most of my experience with school was pretty terrible. Um, and, you know, it it was just such a bad fit between who I was as an individual and a learner, right? And, and that environment that was standardized to sort of one size fits all. Um, and that culminated for me, I, you know, I grew up in rural America and it just, it culminated with in um, my senior year, I, they, they basically kicked me out. I, I like to say I dropped out because it makes it seem like, you know, I had to, I had something to say about it, <laughs> but uh, they just said, listen, you can't graduate. Why are you still here? Um, and so I left uh, early my senior year with a 0 0.9 GPA, which I, I do think you have to work pretty hard <laughs> to do that poorly. Um, and you know, it was an interesting time because not long after that, um, my girlfriend at the time, who's still my wife today, um, found out she was pregnant. And so we started our life, you know, without a high school diploma, you know, uh, having a child. And I was doing a string of minimum wage jobs that just, you know, the kind of jobs you could imagine you get without a high school diploma. And it took a couple of years before I decided that I had something had to change. And, you know, we can dive into that if, if, if that's helpful. But, you know, I ended up getting a GED and decided I needed to try. I went to, to college at Weber State University, which is an open enrollment um, little commuter school, which was fantastic. And it was in that out of desperation, you know, <laughs> we, we only had enough. My, my in-laws and my parents scraped together enough to cover two semesters of school. And they said, well, you got to figure out a way to pay for it. Um, you know, and I, I was still working during the day, but um, so I knew I, I had to, I had to succeed at that. And so out of desperation, sort of learned a lot about who I was and how to make that work. And I had some predefining moments there that I'm happy to share where in retrospect, it's pretty clear why I ended up being interested in the things I'm interested in as a scientist. Um, but it, it taught me a lot about, you know, the importance of fit um, and just how capable most people are. Um, if we can get out of this sort of paradigm we've been using for <laughs> about standardization. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is so fascinating. And I am fascinated by people who hit rock bottom and they turn it around. So I am curious, what was your rock bottom that helped you turn it around? Well, <laughs> rock bottom, uh, you know, so I'm about two years after dropping out, we have two kids. And again, I've been bouncing around minimum wage jobs. We ended up on welfare um which you know was humiliating in, in a lot of ways which still has informed some of the work we do at populace right now which we just we don't treat people facing poverty with the dignity they deserve um but <laughs> the rock, rock bottom for me was <clears throat> i had uh taken a job uh as a home health care assistant and my job was no kidding to give people enemas that was my my entire job i would drive around to people's houses who couldn't leave their home and give them enemas. Now, listen, wow. somebody's got to do that. It's honest work, but <laughs> it, was, it was not great. And um, I had taken it because it paid like a dollar something more an hour and I needed that money. And I just felt like, okay, what am I going to do? And, I, and you know, and I went to Weber State 
uh, I didn't know what the future would be. I just knew the present wasn't sustainable and, and that if I didn't change my life, I was probably going to mess up my children's lives. And that, that felt not okay. Um, and it was, you know, at Weber State, I, I, I viewed myself as, you know, you get a 0 0.9 GPA. It's not hard to internalize that as that I'm stupid, right? Like, what, how, what else would you, <laughs> like, as a kid? Um, it didn't matter what I tried, it just didn't seem to work. And so I went there knowing something had to give, but not having a lot of confidence in myself as a learner, but at least this was some path out of where I was. And I knew enough to know that if I did what they told me, it wasn't going to work out because it didn't work out before. And my dad gave me great advice about, um, like, don't fool yourself, but you need to figure out what works for you. And so I knew pretty early that the relationship with the professor really seemed to matter, that if I had a connection, you know, and I knew that big lecture classrooms didn't really work for me. And so I was trying to make some choices. You know, they, they told me when I first enrolled that I needed to take remedial math. And I'm like, fair enough, but remedial math is the most taken and failed college course in the country. So I'm like, is that how I'm going to start? Like, <laughs> no. Um, so I picked classes I was interested in um, and I started doing okay. And, and but I'll, I'll tell you, there's, just, if, you, if you don't mind, I'll tell you, there's, there's this moment that changed my life forever. Um, and there's a lot of lessons for me in it, which is, so um, I am about, a year into this experiment of going to college and I'd done okay. Um, and I, but I, ha I had to take this history class. It was in this big lecture hall. I couldn't get out of it. So I'm sitting there um, with my friend, Steve, and I'm so bored and the class ends and I'm grabbing my stuff. And I tell Steve, I'm like, this is just the worst. And he said, oh no, it's, it's, um, it's not nearly as bad as what I got myself into in the honors program. So I didn't even know what an honors program was, obviously. <laughs> and um, he tells me about it and he said, you know, oh, it's it's not lectures. There's only like 12 people to a class. And he's like, so you always have to show up. And he said, there are no tests. You just have to debate and write stuff. And he said, I don't think there's right answers. All we do is debate. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. Like amazing to me. Um, and for him, it was awful. And I was so excited about that. I didn't realize there there was could be a learning environment like that, that I just it, impulsively grabbed all my stuff, went up the hill. The, the honors program was on the second floor of the library um, at the top of the hill. I went right there and I walked in uh, to the office and the secretary, a woman named Marilyn Diamond, um, I said, hey, I, I, I want to be in the honors program. And she said, okay, well, let's get you in to see the, the director. And she did, she's, he's, he's here. And I went in and I told him, I said, I wanna be in the honors program. And I'm sitting across his desk and he says, well, this is great. We're really, really proud of the honors program. And he said, just a couple of questions and we'll get you in the system. And he's like, you know, he asked me about my uh, standardized test scores. Like we took the ACTs, right? And it was, they were terrible, right? And he said, he was kind. He said, well, you know, not everyone's good at standardized tests. So he said, what's your, um, what was your high school GPA? <laughs> and I, I, this is no kidding. I said, um, 0.9. And, and his response was, what 0.9? <laughs> and then it dawns on me, oh, no, no, no. Oh, shoot. What have I done? Right. Uh, he's, I said 0 0.9. And, and, you know, he, he was, he was not rude about it. He was like kind, but he just looked at me and he said, you, you can't be in the honors program. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed, right? I just rushed into this thing <clears throat> that sounded good um, and didn't really think about it. And I, I wanted to like crawl into a hole. So I, as fast as I could, I, you know, I apologized to him I, for wasting his time. I, I said, you know, thank you so much. I stood up, shook his hand and I, and I got out of his office. Well, as I'm walking out of the office, Marilyn Diamond, the, the secretary, her desk was right by the door. <clears throat> and then, no kidding, I, I walk out and she reached out and grabbed my arm. And she said, I, listen, I overheard the conversation. Um, if you want this, don't take no for an answer. And I, and I thought, but you can do that? Like, I, you know, and she said, if you want to be in the honors program, just sit on the couch here <clears throat> and don't leave until he lets you in. <laughs> so I did. Um, <clears throat> and then we were about three hours of him coming out and what are you doing? You know, and, um, finally he sticks his head out and he said, okay, come back in. And he sat me down and he said, listen, hot, I, 
why do you want to be in the honors program? Because on paper, I don't get it. Mm-hmm. So I, I explained to him, I said, yeah, look, I know I wasn't a good student historically, but I think I've learned a lot about myself. Here's how I think I learned. And, and I really actually think this is seems like a perfect fit for me. And he said, well, look, I can't let you in formally, but I can, what I'm going to do is make an exception on a provisional basis. I'll let you choose one honors class. And if you do well, I'll let you choose another and we'll go from there. So I, I picked really carefully and I picked a class that I was interested in and I did well um, and I did another. And then to fast forward, uh, two and a half years later, I actually graduated as the honor student of the year um, with a 397 GPA and got into Harvard for my doctorate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I share that because a couple of things. One, I worked really hard. I did. You know, you put the work in. Um, but <clears throat> it taught me two things. That I, th- that I think are important. The first is the incredible value and importance of fit that it, we're so used to thinking you're smart, you're not smart, whatever, but we're living in these standardized worlds with like one size fits all. And when it doesn't work, we assume it's us. Um, and the more that for me, the more you start to know about your own individuality, it allows you to make choices even in narrow environments like like traditional college, where you can find better fit. Um, and once you realize that, like then suddenly I'm capable of things that even I didn't think I was capable of. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is the it's the Maryland diamond, right? It's the, mm-hmm. you can work as hard as you want. We're all gonna need each other. And here's the funniest thing, just to put a close to this story and, and this point. So a couple of years ago, I went back to Weber State and they gave me an award, right? And that, that was that was proud for me. Yeah, you know, I, I, I love that place and it did a lot for me. Um, and it just so happened that Marilyn Diamond was retiring that same year. And I thought, what a great opportunity to like tell this story. She she was there. <laughs> so I tell the story and everybody's it's so touching. And, and the dean says, well, Marilyn, why don't you come up and say a few words, right? Mm-hmm. I thought, what a crow okay, I'm so excited. So she gets up, she gives me a hug. She says she's she's excited to see what I've done with my life. And then she tells the crowd, she says, Todd, but I gotta be honest, I, I don't remember that story. And mm-hmm. I, I was like, oh no. I'm like, but but I didn't make it up. It's rich. But it turns out <clears throat> the reason she didn't remember it is everybody had a Marilyn Diamond story. Like she was just this way to people. She's had a deep belief in people. And, you know, I, I thought about it and I think this is how it works and, and the things we can do for one another is like, this experience for me was literally life-changing. Mm-hmm. Like I wouldn't be here talking to you if Marilyn Diamond hadn't reached out her arm and gave me that timely piece of advice. Life-changing for me and so inconsequential for her that she didn't even remember it. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, when we think about the role we play in other people's lives, I think we can be Marilyn Diamond, it, it, you know, our effort that seems like very little to us, just remember, like, we can be that person. And I, and I think, you know, again, we got to work hard, but we need each other and we can play that role. Oh, that is so inspirational. And I hope that, you know, anybody that's watching this today that might be in a similar situation that, you know, feels like the system or the model is not working for them. Hopefully they're meeting in Maryland to help them expand their idea around, well, maybe there's another way. So thank you for sharing that. I think that's really cool. Um, so let's talk about your book, uh, your best-selling book, Collective Illusions. Why did you write that? Yeah, so um, at my think tank populist, which is is something that I I spun out of Harvard with my co-founder, uh, Dr. Parisa Rohani, um, and because we wanted to do more work in the real world and, you know, universities are good at some things, um, action's not really one of them. So we, <laughs> we wanted to, to be able to do what we want and, and try to make a difference in society as well. Um, wh- one of the things that we're probably most known for uh, is doing what's called private opinion research, because so much of what we're after in society at Populous depends on having an accurate understanding of what people truly think, their values, their priorities, and, and probably it's not surprising to you or um, your audience that right now people aren't necessarily telling the truth about what they think. You know, there's a lot of pressure to say the right thing. Um, and so we knew this and we had to go find methods that were good at getting around that social pressure, um, revealing what people really think. 
Well, one of the things, uh, my background, you know, is in neuroscience and psychology, and um, we are, we were aware of this phenomenon that we call collective illusions, um, but we didn't know how big of a problem it was today. So we started asking, in all the work we do, we always ask, what do you think for yourself? And then what do you think most people would say? Um, and, and, and so let me, I'll just give you, like, what we found was this idea of a collective you're everywhere. So let me let me give just like a, a definition for it and we can talk about where these come from and then why they're why it's so important from my perspective that people are aware of them. So collective illusion are these social phenomena that where a majority of people in a group end up going along with something that they don't personally agree with only because they incorrectly believe that most everybody else in the group agrees with it. So as a result, like entire groups end up doing things that almost nobody actually wanted to do. Okay. So <clears throat> here's what's funny. You hear that, you think, well, that can't happen that often. I mean, how often could we be so wrong about what the group really thinks that we end up doing stuff we don't want to do? And it, it's true. Like we've known about collective illusions for about a hundred years in research. And, you know, up until about 20 years ago, the number of illusions that were uncovered that had a real social consequences were is probably a dozen you know that's not great but, but that's not sort of worthy of a <laughs> of a book i don't think but um in the last decade in particular and and we we probably have more data on this than than anybody in the country right now it, they've just exploded and, and we can talk about why is in part due to social media but um basically you take anything that you care about right now in society, it's a coin toss, whether you're wrong about the group. So maybe if you don't mind, I'll tell you, like, let me tell you sort of where they come from. And then maybe we can get to like the consequences, right? Yes. And also some is, examples. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's, I'll tell you what, let's do some examples. Cause it, unfortunately it's just way too easy to find. And then, then I would love to sort of dig into like why your brain ends up in this place in the first mm -hmm. place and then what, what, why it matters. So right now from our own data like obviously our politics are littered with them um but that's the easy one um what, it, it, i'll give you some political ones and then let's go to the, some life ones that are more interesting on the on the left the biggest illusion that exists right now was around the defund the police movement which is uh, a majority of democrats publicly said that they were in favor of that but in private it's nine percent nine nine Right now, that are nine, right? They, they, uh, of course, you want to reform it. You don't want to just gut the funding. So they, they care about safety, but they they felt like most Democrats believed it and they said it out loud, right? Now, of course, that illusion got shattered pretty quick when it was put to a vote in, say, Minneapolis and things like that. We're like, no, we don't. We don't feel like you have have to give up safety to expect police to actually uphold the law and not violate people's rights. On the right, the one that exists right now which is so dangerous is around whether the election was stolen last election so 57 percent of republicans will publicly say it was stolen it's 14 percent in private mm. okay so this is really dangerous right when the public narrative suggests we believe one thing but in private we actually believe something else but let's talk about politics is kind of boring you know <laughs> so you know i um can i ask you a question though on the on the data collecting of that Mm -hmm. So they they pulled the people. What's your public opinion? And then they pulled the same people. What's your private opinion? How they you get the, do, di the difference? <clears throat> yeah. So so the the methodologies that we use. Um, and stop me if this is too wonky. But ultimately, the the method we didn't invent them. We're not that smart. But um, the the methods depending on what you're going after. We have a report coming out um, in about a week that this deep dive into not just the places where people just are self-silencing but where they're flat out lying about their views it's crazy it's everybody it's ever wait till you see this it's everybody there's no demographic that isn't isn't misleading <laughs> about their views on some issues so the way that you you get at that um that method is the same method that the irs uses to estimate who cheats on their taxes because no one's going to tell you if i call you it's like i'm doing a poll do you cheat on your taxes <laughs> like nobody's saying yes right because mm -hmm. that you can go to jail right um and so there's some clever ways that you create actual anonymity um and plausible deniability which is there's no way for us to reverse engineer your specific answer um but we can actually get at um 
how much agree. And I can go into the details if you want, but it's um, it basically is like you take a sensitive statement like I cheat on my taxes. Okay, and you will do uh, two random samples of, of the public, and you uh, give one group just that those statements and say, do you agree with the statement? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, again, <laughs> you're going to get only only someone that's not terribly bright is going to say, yes, I cheated on my taxes um, in public. And then what you do is in the other group, you embed that statement with like five other statements that aren't controversial, oh, okay. but we but we know exactly how the public responds to those. I and here's the, here's the clever part about it. Those other statements are created so that we know for sure that nobody agrees with all of them and mm -hmm. nobody agrees with none of them, right? So, yeah. so basically, I, then we say, hey, listen, out of these six statements, how many do you agree with? Mm -hmm. And so we know it won't be six and we know it won't be zero. And then you can actually extract from those two the comparison from the public statement okay. to this you, you you know how many people actually agree with that statement. Yes, yes. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, so, yeah that's that's the wonky uh, uh, details. But there's other methods we use as well. But the point is, you as a respondent, number one, like you know that nobody could possibly know exactly your view of any one of those things. That's the key. Mm -hmm. um, and then it turns out people are, are pretty, pretty comfortable um, uh, sharing that way. And um, those methods have been sort of shown to be much better. They predict private behavior like um, buying decisions and voting patterns better than public opinion. So, so we have all this. Um, let's, let's talk about um, something more interesting uh, with collective illusions. So let's take something like what your view of a successful life is. Like, what do you want? What's a good life? What do you want out of life? So we did the largest private opinion study ever on this. And the method we use here, which I really love, is a method called conjoint. Um, it's the same method that Apple uses to decide the combination of features and price in an iPhone. You can't have everything, right? It's trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So what you do for this is we, we sourced 76 possible things that could go into a good life. Everything from being the richest person you know to being a parent, right? And everything in between. And rather than just ask you point blank, do you want to be rich? Um, well, I mean, you know, okay, or famous. Um, you actually are given, you, the task is you say, you're shown two people, person A, person B. And we just randomly grab six attributes from the 76 and say, this is person A, here's person B. Which one of these two is closer to your view of a successful person? Mm -hmm. And you're like, hmm, it's a little tough. I'll choose person A. You do it again and again and again until every attribute has been traded off against every other attribute. And then I can build a personal profile for you of your rank order priorities for a successful life. It's kind of cool. And it's kind of revealing, I gotta be honest. Like what, what I think about myself and then what shows up when I when I make real choices. Um, so here's what's cool. And we again, we do that like every choice, you're like, what would you think? And what do you think most people would say? Okay, so when it comes to a successful life, because again, what's more important than the life you wanna live? Mm -hmm. The in private, you'd be quite proud of, of the American public it's 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 really focused on character on relationships on contribution mm -hmm. they want they want to live a fulfilling life they want to be good people and and for the life of them they don't understand why somebody else should should have to lose for them to to win right it's it's like you look at it, you're like oh these are people i would want to be around mm -hmm. when you look at what we think most americans <laughs> one out of life it's just the, it's just awful right mm -hmm. it's like this zero sum uh focus on wealth and status and power and Dang. you're just like oh yes so so you're this is great you're you're anticipating exactly where i want to go with this <laughs> so like the um it's like you've done this before right um when the number one thing that we think most americans care about for success is fame mm -hmm. Number one, and by a long shot, we think this is what most people care about, right? In private, it's actually dead last. Mm -hmm. I, dead can, last. I can see that because people put like a Kim Kardashian mm -hmm. on a pedestal, billions and millions of followers, and people think she's it. But then in private, they're like, that's the most obnoxious person in family, you know? So <laughs> right? it's Isn't it? And so, and so what's funny is we, we get this information and we're like, go to our, our friends in advertising, our friends in, in Hollywood and say, listen, why do you keep shoving this down our throat? People don't want this. 
then you realize they're under the same illusion, right? So our advertising friends are like, no, we're just giving people what they want. But then here's the trap, right? Which is, I don't care about fame, but then I see a Rolex ad that's selling me fame. And I'm like, obviously somebody cares or else why would they be advertising it, right? And so we're stuck in this loop. Now, here, here's why this is like really important to understand. So we all know we don't care about this. We just think everybody does. And here we are. Our children aren't in on it. Mm. They don't understand that this is not how we think about the world for real. And the, the dangerous thing about collective illusions is this generation's illusions tend to become next generation's private opinion unless you do something. And, and, and here's with the fame thing, some concrete information about that. So my, my colleagues at UCLA for a long time have been studying every year how middle school kids, what do they internalize from media and culture? about values, right? Mm -hmm. As they're sort of becoming more adult-like. Um, up until a few years ago, every single year, the dominant theme was character related. That's great. That's amazing that this is what they're internalizing, right? Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, it changed to, I want to be famous and it hasn't changed back. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, I remember they did some interviews with some of the kids that were in these studies and one kid said, I want to have a million followers. And they said, okay, at what? And he said, doesn't matter. I just want to have a million followers. So look, it, it's bad enough that because of our unwillingness to be honest about our, our views with each other, we're allowing our children to internalize a pretty empty, dead-end view of a good life that they're going to find out the hard way isn't very fulfilling. What happens when it's broader? And I can tell you these other illusions. When you look at what people want for the future of the country, mm -hmm. we have incredible common ground in private, but we don't believe it, yeah. right? That's never um, what's on the news. There, no. It's always like, get in your corner and fight. Yep. And, and so we've got this, this moment. It, it's whether it's the life you want to live, the kind of country you want to live in. We, we've built these instruments for our institutions. What do people want out of education, higher ed, criminal justice, health care, you name it. The, the common denominator is we are shockingly united in private about our, our, our desires, our preferences, our values, and we're under massive collective illusions. And so we're, we're sitting around thinking most people in this country no longer share my values when they do. Most people don't want out of education what I want for my kid when they do. Right, and and the consequences are are, are pretty straightforward. Uh, collective illusions tend to do a couple of things that are really bad. Three things, really. Um, they erode social trust. Well, of course, right? Like if I don't think people share my values, why would I trust them? You know, they um, they sow uh, false polarization. Right? Obviously, that would be true. Um, and then basically, as a consequence, they basically make social progress all but impossible. Um, so this is where we're at in this country right now. And most people don't even know what a collective illusion is. And so maybe we could turn, if you don't mind, kind of share, like, it sounds almost ridiculous. Like, how could this, how could we get here? Exactly. How could we be so how wrong? did we get here? Yeah, because you might imagine for this kind of systematic misunderstanding, it must be like just biased media, bad actors, which those all exist. Mm -hmm. But it's actually simpler than that, um, which is both bad and good, right? In terms of what we can do about it. Collective illusions happen because of how your brain's wired. And you just have to know two things about your brain to know everything you need to know about collective illusions. So the first is every human being on the planet has a conformity bias. By that, I just mean all else equal, we prefer to be with our groups, not against them. Doesn't mean we won't go against groups. We just would prefer it. And if you don't mind, I'll give you the, like, <laughs> like when I say we have a conformity bias, I, let me just show you how hardwired that really is. Um, you know, my background's in, in neuroscience uh, uh, in part. And um, I always like to pick examples where I can't believe people got paid to do to do the study. So my, my colleague in the Netherlands, he wanted to know just how far our conformity bias really goes. Mm -hmm. And he did this study, which I think is just a fancy version of hot or not, <laughs> which he, he wanted to know, like, does conformity bias work under something as subjective as who you think is attractive? Mm -hmm. So this, this was the study. He brings people in, puts them in, in an fMRI scanner. And all, if you're in this study, all he's asked you to do is lay there and he would show you pictures of people's faces. And your job was to rate them in terms of how attractive they are from one to five. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, so far so good. Now here's here's the recall. After every time you give a rating, you are shown a number that corresponds to what the average of all the people who have done the study before you. How did they? What's they? How did they rate the same face? But it's completely rigged. So it's rigged. Those numbers are just made up. <clears throat> and it, what the whole point is is that half the time, the score is going to be the exact same as yours. So you're with your group. Mm. The other half, it's going to be very different than you, right? So, and then we're going to watch what your brain does. And here, here's what happens. On the trials where you're told that your, your rating for attractive faces is the same as your group, it triggered a dopamine reward response in your brain. The same response that hard drugs activate, which mm. is what makes them addictive, mm. okay? Conversely, when you're told your view of attractiveness deviates from your group, it triggers what neuroscientists call an error signal. It's this cascading electrical signal that disrupts attention, memory, and, and even motor functioning. It's just meant to stop what you're doing, pay attention because something's really wrong. Um, and it's meant to correct behavior. Okay, so this is what happens just on something like attractiveness. That's what I mean when I say we have a hardwired bias to conformity. Okay, and, and obviously like that comes with benefits, right? Like we don't have to learn everything the hard way if we if we learn from our group <laughs> and it, it makes culture possible. And obviously that has some risk with like group think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now here's where collective illusions come in. For conformity to even work, you actually have to know what your group thinks. Right? Obviously, because if otherwise, how, what would you conform to? And this is this is the problem. I, I, for as important as conformity is, your brain is spectacularly bad at estimating group consensus because it takes this shortcut. There's no kidding. Your brain assumes the loudest voices repeated the most are the majority. Mm -hmm. It's right. a shame. Yeah, it, and I, I guess it, it's, it saves a lot of energy to take that shortcut for your brain. And I guess maybe when we lived in, a, in, in small communities with like a hundred people where you knew everybody, mm -hmm. it, it obviously worked mm -hmm. well enough. But you put that in an age of social media and you can start to see the problem, right? That that shortcut. So let's just, let's put some numbers to that. On Twitter alone, 80% of all content is created by 10% of the users. And we know from Pew Research that that 10%, they're not remotely representative of the general public. They, they tend to be extreme on almost every social issue. But you could sort of see the problem, right? So if only 10% of people hold a view, but you think it's 80, mm -hmm. your brain assumes that's the majority and your conformity bias kicks in. So unless you're willing to go against the group, you'll just say nothing or, or you'll say what you need to say to go along, right? Mm -hmm. But if enough of us do that, right? If enough of us self-silence, then the, the fringe view is the only view people hear, the results of collective illusion. And, and, and so, this is where we are right now. If you look at, uh, we've got data on this and so do about you know, half a dozen organizations. Right now in America, somewhere between 55 to 60% of adults and young adults admit right now that they are not telling the truth about their views for fear of, of cancel, being canceled. Losing their just, job. Yes. But how, how do we function as a democracy if most people are not being honest with other people about what they really think, mm -hmm. right? It, it's just, it's it's not sustainable. Um, and so the problem is, is unless you know about the phenomenon of collective illusion and you, and you start to trust that, hey, you know what, my brain, I can't trust my brain anymore to tell me what my group thinks. Why would, you, why would anyone assume, no, my brain's lying to me, right? So it's like, we have to recognize this is the consequence of the technologies we've created, which have some upside. Mm -hmm. um, but unless we can get over this and, and find both the moral courage to be honest with each other about what we think and the civic courage to make it safe for other people to do that, mm -hmm. we are going to be continue to be led by a very vocal fringe on both sides of almost every issue. Um, and the result is we are going to tear ourselves apart from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would you mind commenting a little bit about like, obviously, a collective illusion was the Nazis and believing... Yes you know, that and going along with that, um, or even with the communists and the gulags and putting mm -hmm. people in, in those camps. Um, 
Can you touch a little bit on the cult-like mindset that comes with these collective illusions? Yeah. So, I mean, you're making a good point. I mean, some of the greatest atrocities in history we know were results of collective illusions and, you know, something even closer to home. I'll, I'll give you two examples, but like, so we know we have private opinion, not me. I wasn't born then, but like in the late fifties and sixties and the seventies, uh, Hubert O'Gorman did some of the earliest private opinion research and he did it about, uh, white southerners attitudes about racial integration and and commitment to segregation <clears throat> he had he knew and we knew that a majority of white people in the south were did not like segregation and wanted integration a decade earlier than we got it because even though they privately wanted it they were completely convinced that the overwhelming majority of white people in the south were still in favor of segregation and so these people were like, well, I'm not going to stick my neck out, right? I don't want to do this. And it turned out the very people who wanted integration when push came to shove would publicly endorse policies that, that entrenched segregation because they just didn't want to go against their group, right? So you can hold back social progress there um, at a bigger scale. And this is both, you know, the downside, but also like what's possible with collective illusions and social change. Probably the best example of this that I've ever found is the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, which was the only time that I'm aware of where we've overthrown, this was communist regime, and uh, you know, an authoritarian regime without anybody losing their life. Mm -hmm. And here's what makes this story so remarkable. It was actually led by Václav Havel, wasn't a politician, wasn't a military leader. He was a poet. And a playwright, <laughs> like, and um, by the way, just if, unless I forget, for your audience, if you want to read probably the most inspirational sixty-page document you're ever going to read, he wrote a treaty called "The Power of the Powerless." It's free online. It is. It sounds like he's writing for us today. It is so unbelievable. It's just worth reading. Um, but here's here's what happened. So they're in the grips of communism. It's brutal, a brutal regime. Um, and Havel's a dissident, right? He doesn't like it. And he's, he writes um, a play called The Garden Party, which is a, a satire of communism. But he has to make it so subtle that, the, that the, the screeners don't know they're being made fun of, right? So it slips through the critics. It gets out. It becomes the Hamilton of its time. It's like runaway, like sold out every night. You know, people keep coming in. And he said they every night they laughed at all the right parts like you wouldn't things you wouldn't find funny if you actually believed in communism so he, he, it dawns on him that what's going on here is most people don't really believe in communism they're just saying they believe in communism because they think this is what everybody believes mm -hmm. so here we are they're stuck in this but his genius which like we know we know why this worked now but i can't believe he figured it out was that under this kind of an illusion, the answer was not military. It wasn't even to form a political party. It wasn't to confront the power directly. It was to, to create the spaces that got people comfortable with being honest about their views, what he called personal responsibility and authenticity. And he was just made fun of. Like people did not take him seriously. Like, this is ridiculous. You are not going to confront military power and authoritarian regime with being authentic, right? Mm -hmm. But he did it. Um, and what was so fascinating is it takes, you know, close to a decade and they're working. And, and this is what's so amazing under collective illusions is how fast the change can happen. So only a few, a, a short while before the revolution, he's interviewed by uh, an international magazine. And he he says, listen, I'm I'm in it for the rest of my life. But, but change takes so much time and I don't think I'll live to see the actual change, but, but I'm still going to do it. Three months later, he was the first democratically elected president of a free Czechoslovakia. Right? This is because this is what's possible under collective illusions, because again, we don't have to commit, we don't have to change people's minds. Mm -hmm. We just have to reveal our shared values. Uh, I'll give you a current example of this is uh, the marriage equality movement in America. So that is the fastest change, like approval for gay marriage, mm -hmm. the fastest change in public opinion ever recorded. Mm -hmm. 
in the span, like 2003 to 2018, 2003, it's about 30% approval. By 2018, it's 70% approval, right? It completely flips. So what had happened was in 2003, you had this gathering of, of academics and activists, I believe it was in Chicago, but I, I, I could get that wrong. And they look at public opinion polling and they say, listen, they, they say, don't even try for marriage because the public's so against it, it will, it will hold back progress on anything else. Mm -hmm. But a small group of them had private opinion data that showed, in fact, you had a very slim majority who was actually okay with it. And that was what I'd call like the love is love crowd and then libertarians who were like, it's not my thing, but I don't think the government should say what you do. Mm -hmm. So they broke off and went to Hollywood and realized, listen, if, if, if the real challenge is getting that majority to be vocal about their views, we need to create the social proof that shows them they are the majority. So that was the, the, the effort at like will and grace and other kinds of things that normalized this, that gave people the correct impression that this is what most people thought. And so, and then you combine that with like the come out of the closet movement, which is like, the more that I know, I see people mm -hmm. who, 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 who actually live this way um, change. Anyway, so, so when you look at these kind of things, for me, I look and say, okay, they ca collective illusions cause enormous personal and social damage. When yeah, broken forced. relationships, broken up families over a collective illusion. <laughs> yes, think about it. Like even just like if you fall for the illusion of of someone else's view of success, we on our data on that, we looked at life satisfaction as well. And here's what's kind of cool: the to the extent that you achieve on your own personal priorities for a successful life. It translates, not surprisingly, to much higher life satisfaction. This seems obvious, right? Like, mm -hmm. but here's what's really cool. No amount of achievement on what you think other people think is success translates at all to higher life satisfaction. So there's a personal cost here. But now think about the relational costs, right? The social costs when we're looking at each other right now in this country and there, there's talk of like civil war yeah. that we're so divided that we just can't even function anymore. I can tell you, look, we are divided on some things. We're divided on immigration. We're divided on half of That pales in comparison to the shocking amount of common ground across demographics. So it, it is not our divisions that are actually the problem. It's the collective illusions around those things because they become real in their consequences, right? And, and so you look at this and you think about the damage and, and, and here's what I'd say at a sort of social change level, not just a personal level. It really matters that we're aware of is the problem private division or is it a collective illusion? Because the strategy you use is completely different. So we talked about a successful in the Velvet Revolution. They use what's called social proof mechanisms. The last thing in the world that you want to do under an illusion is try to persuade someone because it tends to actually entrench the illusion. Let me give you an example of this because it's just, it, it, it'd be funny if it wasn't kind of sad is, do you remember back, um, you're probably too young for this, but like, remember in the nineties that like the say no to drugs? Oh yeah, campaign? yeah, yeah. Okay. Nancy Reagan. Okay, so, so <laughs> yes. And, and, and like the D.A.R.E. program and this, yep. okay. So all of this has started because there was a small increase in first time drug use amongst adolescents, right? The government spent a billion dollars, which doesn't sound like much now, <laughs> but it was like a lot of money on a national ad campaign meant to scare kids straight, right? Yep, the egg in the frying pan. Yes, which was so <laughs> stupid. This is your brain on drugs. Any question? I'm like, yeah, how, how is my brain like a, an egg on, in a frying pan? But um, the, okay, from a ad standpoint, it was like incredibly successful. The typical American teenager saw three ads a day for six years. Mm. Now, here, here's the problem. The government just assumed that the reason that kids were trying drugs is because they were interested in drugs. But even back then, we had private opinion data that showed that was not true. Most kids were very, very skeptical about drugs. What they wanted was to fit in. And they were under an illusion that most teenagers in America were doing drugs. Okay, so if I want to fit in, I think everybody does drugs, I try drugs, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so under that illusion, you bring a billion dollar ad campaign, scaring them straight. So what did they internalize from those campaigns? 
this must be what we're doing because why would adults try so hard to convince us not to? And this is no kidding. The result was an increase in first time drug use directly attributed to the campaign itself. Mm. Like I actually imagined that there were some poor family who we took their tax money to do this. And the result was their kid got hooked on drugs. Yeah. Right. So this is what I mean. It, it, it matters. It, if, if it's an illusion, it's a completely different strategy for how you, yeah. how you solve it um, than it is if, if you're really trying to change private opinion. Yeah. So I don't know. If, I mean, I'm real interested on like, okay, so when you have illusions about the past or about past experiences or your traumas and they get played and the illusion gets altered, how does that work with your brain? Um, and yeah, same, trying say to more resolve about that. that. Yeah, say more about that. So just, you know, a lot of times people are, are traumatized. They have the mm -hmm. PTSD, they have the complex PTSD yeah. if they get older. And a lot of it is because it's grounded in past memories. It's not present. Yeah. It's not presently happening to them, but it's affecting them today, what happened in the past. So yeah. I'm just wondering, um, do some of those traumas, some of that PTSD, that complex PTSD fall under this collective or personal illusions? Yeah, it would be more like a personal illusion. And I think the, the, the consequence is very similar, right? But we'll make a, a small distinction, which is um, it is certainly the case, right? That that um, our interpretation of the experience is what is actually going to drive our current behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I can tell you it, that like people's actual memories for things are not nearly as accurate um, as our confidence in our own memories, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you've seen a lot of this in it, not to say that like, horrific things don't happen to people. They, they certainly do. Um, but some of the most effective therapies are ones that actually help really create a, a greater form of accuracy in form of empowerment there, because often we get um, we get trapped by uh, memories that are actually more expansive, more um, and different, even just different than yeah. they were. And so you're trying to solve for something that is different, you know, than the real yeah. cause. Um, so similar mechanism there. The only distinction is under collective illusions, the pull of my behavior is not in response to uh, uh, something that's already happened to me. It's in response to me wanting to be with my group right now. Right. But you can say the same thing, right? So mm -hmm. it, like the, the, the commonality there is uh, it, it might be good or bad to respond to those appropriately. But um, if you're wrong about the memory or you're wrong about the group, then mm -hmm. your own behavioral response is going to be suboptimal at best and probably counterproductive for you at worst. So how do we go about trying to resolve collective illusions in society? Like what can we do individually? What can we do in our relationships? What can we yeah. say when we open up social media and maybe some tools that we could use? Yeah, look, I mean, I'll give you this. It'll sound really simple, but it's, it's, it's unbelievably important. Like there's really only one way out of this. And it's these hard earned norms of liberal society, including, you know, tolerance and inclusion and a commitment to free speech, which is not listening to people who are like you. We don't, I don't need, I don't need free speech to, to, to let you say what you want if I agree with you, right? That's just the in-group and, and echo chamber. Um, and, you know, the, the truth is, is, there's not a lot of te technological solutions here. There are some, right? Like, for example, um, on social media, that's been this illusion mechanism has been weaponized by China and Russia, and and probably others, but they do it um, systematically where they use social bots, um, which People are, are just, arguing with the bot. <laughs> they are. It's it's it, it's it's crazy. Like we know um, from research that online, it only takes you interacting. If 5% of your interactions are with bots and those bots are smart enough, they can completely manipulate perceived group consensus. Now, what's terrifying is the typical person in America, 19% of their engagements online are with bots. And so here, here's what happens. Um, what they do is like these, these bad state actors, they'll have these hundreds of thousands of bots. They will go into conservative Twitter, liberal Twitter, which have almost no overlap. It's, it's pretty comical. Like we, we do not talk to each other. We shout at each other, but we don't really talk to each other or follow each other. Um, and they will analyze sentiment and they will find the fringe views. So they're real Americans with real views. And then they will swarm and retweet to the, to, until most people like, so if I'm, let's say I'm conservative and I'm like, wait, 
loudest voices repeated the most, like, is this what we believe? And I'm like, I don't believe that. Meanwhile, I'm watching them do the same thing on the left. And I'm like watching them go crazy, it seems like. And I'm like, well, I'm not them. So I'm either going to be abandoned by my group, which is terrifying, or I'll just scooch over and, and pretend I'm okay with this view, which is better than the alternative. Mm -hmm. They're doing that right now, and they are driving that false polarization. So there are some things, which is, for example, you know, Elon Musk's effort, which it looks like he's probably not going to buy Twitter, but like his idea of like, you, you just got to get rid of the bots. These social media platforms don't want to do that because because it inflates the numbers. It, it, it allows them to say, look- Keeps yeah, eyeballs on screen. <laughs> yep, and you're like, it's not. They're like, there's so many bots. And, and, and a lot of influencers, a lot of people like actually use this as a mechanism. It, so it, you get rid of that, it does solve something. It doesn't solve the underlying mechanism, which is the value of social media is that in theory, it actually is very democratizing, right? It gives everybody a voice, mm -hmm. right? Again, in theory, that, and, and by the way, that's great. I'd rather learn how to deal with this trade-off than go back to something where only powerful people have the ability to change. That's it. So, yeah. It is giving everybody a voice, but there are some censorship and things that are happening that are taking people's voices as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're not, um, so if you do the get rid of bots, but also look, there's this shadow banning and censorship. You're giving a small number of tech people the ability to decide what's okay to talk about and what's not. And, and this is just not okay. Even though, even though quite, quite frankly, the things that they often ban, I'm like, yeah, okay. I personally would be okay with that. I am okay. You know, like there's certain people that kicked off Twitter. I'm like, good. <laughs> like, I don't want, but I'm like, that's not okay. Right. It's not, it's, it's like. Well, I, we always have the choice not to be on Twitter. We always have the right. choice not to download these apps and participate in what you're seeing. Isn't, isn't that the funny thing, which is we forget that the whole point of this is like, you have an ability, you don't have to be there. You don't have to engage in this. And yet rather than sit, realizing, okay, I'm not gonna participate in that, I would rather get into the fight about who gets to speak up on these things and I'm willing to censor. It's just there, that never ends well. It never ends well. So there, there are some tech angles here, but at the end of the day, like a strong support of the norms of liberal society is the complete uh, antidote to this because if my values, if what it means to belong to my group is to is to actually at minimum tolerate your view and at a maximum actually want to hear from you, even though I vehemently disagree with you, then that 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 dopamine reward response, right, that comes with being with my group. Like what's powerful about liberal norms is that it gives me that reward response for doing the very thing that otherwise I might not want. I don't I want to shut you down because I think you're wrong. But it I is a reward rewarded. response, but it's short-lived. Even though yeah. like you get that dopamine hit with that arguing with that stranger or having somebody come rescue and take your side yeah. and you know yeah. go back and forth. And you close it down and now you, you probably feel like crap again. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so this is why, like at the end of the day, these this commitment to these liberal values like free speech and, and peaceful pluralism and tolerance are so important. And and here, here's something that is just so back to collective illusions on this, one of the most important illusions we've ever found is around the commitment to, to free speech, and this free expression. So there's sort of a public narrative out there that it, the center right still cares about free speech, but the center left is giving up on that value. It is absolutely not true. In fact, if anything, the center left in private has slightly higher commitment to free speech. But here's the problem. They don't think that Democrats still value it. So now if, I, if I'm a Democrat, I'm like, no, I still want this. In fact, historically, this has been our thing, right? Like free speech and listening to, to marginalized views. And um, But now I'm choosing between saying things that I think my group wants to hear and telling you what I really think. And so we end up in a culture of censorship across the board with some fringes driving this. So if you're listening to this and realizing like, listen, I promise you, the American people still care deeply about these values, but they don't think like we do. And so this creates this death spiral where we enable more and more censorship. Because think about it, like if, if I believe we no longer care about these norms, and now it's just a fight to decide which views are going to define society, well, then I should fight for my views, right? Like at the end of the day, if this is how it's going to go, I think my views are better than the other side. And so we start engaging in very illiberal 
behavior in response to the illusion that we're losing our liberal values. Mm -hmm. So just step back and realize like the most important thing you can do right now is if you could it, look, if you're afraid to speak up, sometimes there are real look economic consequences and other kinds of consequences. Like, I'm not saying put yourself at risk, but I am saying like, think about ways in which you can still keep your voice in a respectful way and realize that that groups don't really punish people for trying to make up their mind and, and thinking it through. If, and if you can't do that, you, what you can do and, you, and you're never gonna get in trouble for by your group is actually supporting other people's ability to speak up. Like, like that. this is, and, and, and finding those opportunities for like people you actually disagree with and just being able to say, listen, I, I don't actually agree with this person, but I think they have a right to be heard. That kind of stuff, it sends a, a bright signal to everybody else that th these are your values mm -hmm. and you're not going to get attacked for supporting someone that you don't agree with it just it, it's it, it doesn't happen that way um and you can have a massive effect on shattering the illusions in society and again if we don't do this if we don't get back to this um we are going to tear ourselves apart and and look it would it, it would be one thing and it'd be sad enough if the sort of american experiment ends because we really really are so divided that it doesn't function but it's tragic for this to end under collective illusions that were within our power to to shatter um and and that we, we have a bright future ahead of us if we can recognize that fact yeah. it's never going to happen as long as we have like psychopathic narcissistic leadership and opportunistic and people trying to make money off of all of this infighting um you know that's that's our problem is we obviously need some uh, people that really understand what this is and that can model yeah. and really you have to like change kind of at the core. Absolutely. And, and that that leadership is going to come not from politics, because listen, I, I you probably just say like the number of politicians I know, like like politicians. With some exceptions are not leaders. They're mm -hmm. really not leaders. They're bad they actors. Are, <laughs> yes. And they're they want power yeah. and they they are put your finger to the wind. And, you know, it's like, you see some people marching in the street, you get out in front of them and call it a parade and, and you're leading it. Like they're not leaders. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to stop thinking of them that way. They are deeply susceptible to illusions because what they're trying to do is tell you what you want to hear. Oh yeah, they're and, compromised. No, exactly. And so what's happening is you see these vocal fringes, these leadership on the fringes, they, they, they have told us what we think we want to hear as groups and we're all following them off a cliff so that leadership has to come in two places one is it has to come from uh, our cultural leaders right which unfortunately are in short supply i mean short of like oprah i don't know who we all <laughs> listen to anymore, right? but 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 then there's something you know under social proof mechanisms there's a thing called contact theory right which is this is how the marriage equality movement worked in terms of the coming out campaign which is each one of us actually has far more influence with collective illusions in our communities, in our small circles, than we give ourselves credit for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in our families. And unfortunately, we have a lot of um, absent parents, um, yeah. broken families, and um, you know, where people used to have God and systems, now they have celebrities as their God. And so there's yeah. somewhat of a, a disconnect on trying to find you know, real admirable, honorable people to uh, not follow, but, you know, be a part yeah. of that group. Yeah. And and the thing is, is what we've really decimated is the sort of civic level of society where, you know, you go all the way back to the, the beginning of this country and the Tocqueville who wrote about democracy in America. And he said, we're, Americans were just a, a country of joiners. We belong to so many groups at local levels, right? We were a part of so many things. We've gutted that, right? Like you said, that like religion's on the decline, um, but our community organizations are on declines. So what are we left with? We trade our religion for our politics, right? We trade we trade yeah. admirable people who have earned respect through their through their character and their accomplishments for celebrity, mm -hmm. and then we wonder why you know this isn't going very well. And and th that's the bad news. The good news is. People are fed up with it. They don't want it. It's not the life they want to live. If we recognize that, we can rebuild our civic level. We can, like, and we just have to do it. And there still are organizations, like if you, by the way, if, if you're so worried about what people think, if this is your biggest concern, there's some really simple things you can do 
to inoculate your brain from this conformity bias. And the first thing is, is it sounds so simple, but you've got to diversify the groups you belong to. And it turns out like there's a nice rule of three. If you need to belong to at least three groups that matter to you. And it doesn't have to be like, I'm a Democrat and I'm Catholic or whatever, like big macro things. They just have to matter to you. And if you are involved in at least three groups that matter to you, the research is pretty clear that the, the pool of any one group doesn't create that reward and error signal in the same strength as it does if you just belong to one group. If you, if you can only think of one group that matters to you, they have cult-like power over you and you're in really big Point. trouble. So there's there steps we can take right now um, on our path back to a commitment to that more liberal society um, and getting back to like admiring and looking up to the very people who we that, that embody the lives we want to live in private, right? So it's up to us. I know it seems like a heavy lift, but you'll be shocked. Again, under collective illusions, the kind of change that happens when each one of us starts to make this commitment, mm -hmm. it tends to open the door for exponentially more people. Mm -hmm. So it creates this what's called bandwagon change. And, and then you'll see it move in a hurry. So just realize you have more power than you think. Mm -hmm. um, this willingness to conform to what you think your group wants has left you in a place where your life is diminished and most of us know it, right? Most of us know this isn't fulfilling. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's not enough motivation for you, recognize that your conformity to the illusion is literally destroying the very group that you care so much about that you're willing to conform in the first place. Oh, that's so good. Well, we're getting here toward the end. Um, do you have any like final thoughts that you would like to share uh, with regards to collective illusions? Yeah, just, I mean, look, in summary, look, guys, it sounds like the sky is falling um, <laughs> and it's not good, right? We've got a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. but as someone who's studied this for a very long time and understands the history of it, it's actually good news given what the alternative is. Mm -hmm. Because if the world was what it feels like it is right now, we would be in really big trouble because if if we were so divided in private as it seems like we are in public, you know, if, if things were going that way, there's really not a solution. I mean, how do you deal with that really in the short term? But the fact that it's these are by and large collective illusions mm -hmm. means that if we don't do anything, right, they're gonna wreak havoc on us and they will still do that. But it means we have a lot more power a lot more power, way more power than we thought we did as individuals. We don't have to be famous. We don't have to be actually powerful over other people to have an effect. And if we recognize the real nature of the problem and we take whatever responsibility we can in our small circles of life, uh, I promise you, like th the amount of change individually and collectively that we can create in such a short amount of time will take your breath away. So I look at this and think we're at a fork in the road. Uh, if we get this right, um, the place we will get to will be something that is so much better than we could have possibly imagined. And if we don't, it's going to keep going the direction it's going. And, and I don't know how that is even remotely sustainable. So mm -hmm. we have a choice to make each one of us. Um, and it begins with understanding the role that collective illusions play in where we've gotten to as a society. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Rose. I do appreciate your work and what you're trying to accomplish. And I hope more and more people get your book, uh, go to your website on Populous and try to, you know, figure out how to like implement that and apply it to their own life because it's very important work. We're definitely at a crossroads and um, I just think you're doing an awesome job. So thank you for coming on my channel today. Thanks for having me. Yes, yes. And if you guys like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave a comment down below and hit the bell to be alerted to when the next video drops. And don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.